nice to be welcomed. <laughs> it's nice to be invited to speak. It's also challenging. I'm sure that if I was to pick any one of you now, you could probably say a few words that would be supportive and encouraging of everybody here. But that's not your job. I want to begin by telling a little story out of the Gospels. It occurs in several places. And this is a story about the people who called on the name of Jesus, who followed in the way of Jesus, and who on this occasion were deeply disturbed by the circumstance of their life. Many of the apostles were fishermen, and on this day the fishermen were out in their boat on the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is vulnerable to rapid storms, fierce storms. And on this day, the folks in the boat were getting a little bit nervous as it was rocking and rolling and upping and downing, and they feared that the boat was going to go under and that their lives were likely liable to being lost. And in the middle of their fear, one of them looked up and he saw what appeared to be a ghost coming across the water, walking towards them. And then they realized, hey, this is Jesus. Jesus was approaching them in their trouble and when Jesus got in the boat, the storm was calm, the waters were quiet, peace was restored. I'd like you to think of the boat as the church. I'd like to think you to think of the fishermen as the people in the church. And I'd like you to think about our historical period as a time when the winds of history are blowing in a strong way and things are happening that are making us nervous, sometimes scared, and we're wondering, what's our future? And what I'd like you to understand is that when trouble deepens, when conflict is at large, when anxiety seems to be taking root in our hearts, it's at that moment that God decides to intercede. God decides to get involved. But that requires something of us. That requires of us an invitation. Dear God, I'm confused. I'm scared. I'm worried. Would you help me find my way forward? Now we have texts today that are about forgiveness in the first place. The first chess text from the Gospel is about Jesus meeting with the folks who have been walking with him for about three years. They've been learning important life lessons. They've been watching as Jesus reveals what it is that God wants from human beings. And you know that in a basic sense, what Jesus revealed is compassionate care for all those who are excluded from the love of God. And not just excluded by circumstance, but sometimes excluded by the powers that govern the world, the structures of society which make it possible for some to live well, which make it possible for some to prosper and to thrive, and while that is happening, others are being left out. Jesus, in his earthly minister, goes about including those who are left out, and that's a clue to us about the mission of the church. We are followers of Jesus. What Jesus did, we do. At least, that's the hope. But the key thing is that up until this point, Jesus has been the example. Jesus has been shining his light and letting people find their way in the darkness. They were deeply, deeply disturbed when he was crucified. They rejoiced when they saw him alive from the dead. Jesus is gathered with the followers, not so that they can celebrate him, but so that he can convey to them his mission, so that it becomes their mission. 
And the text says that Jesus breathed on them. And they received the Holy Spirit. Now some of you know your Bibles quite well and will recognize there's an echo there of the Garden of Eden where God shaped human beings and they were made of clay and God breathed into them and they became living souls. Jesus breathed as a symbol to say to the folks, you now have the spirit that was in me. As I was in the world, you are now equipped to be. And Jesus gives them one clear commission. Forgive sin. Jesus says, forgive others. And that's because sin is a problem. An example being in a community like our church, there are times in which we do not see our brother or our sister as somebody who we love. We see them as a bit of a pain in the butt. Somehow their behavior upsets us, their behavior annoys us, and we talk about them when they're not in the room. Jesus wants that to stop. Jesus knows that any human community that is subject to that kind of divisive thinking, that kind of divisive action, that community has no future. So one of the most important tasks that each of us has as a person inspired by Jesus, having Jesus' Spirit breathed into us, each of us is called to the work of forgiveness. And it's going to be important for me to say that sometimes the most primary place where forgiveness is needed is in your own heart. To have the ability to look at yourself clearly, to know who you are, to know your strengths, to know your weaknesses, but not to feel guilt and shame about the ways in which you haven't always measured up to God's righteous expectation. Jesus wants us to be free from sin. And it's important for me to let you know that sin is not some moral category. Sin is a simple thing that divides us or separates us from God. It's as if we can see the whole world and sin is the closing of our eyes, so we can no longer see. Sin prevents us from seeing and experiencing the love of God. It makes us feel guilty and ashamed, and we are in need of forgiveness, and the practice of forgiveness is one of the most important things we can do for our families, for our neighbors, and for our communities. Jesus came to set us free from that which separates us from God, and in a particular way, that which separates us from one another. Jesus is calling the human race to unity, all while there is a power at work seeking to divide us. You know the old saying, divide and conquer. We over the last decades or so have been increasingly individualized. That's why churches are emptying out. But God is calling us to be united. That's a nice thing to say in the United Church of Canada. God is calling humanity to be united in love so that we can address the problems that face us with the hope of remedy, with the hope of healing. Now the apostles, after Jesus has resurrected and gone into heaven, after they have become a community of faith, after they have a unity of spirit, they find themselves in trouble with the powers of religion in their day. And it's important for us to recognize that religion can lead us down dark roads. Religion can come up, become about power, it can become about prestige, it can become about privilege, rather than about service. It can become about something other 
than what God expects of us. And in this text from Acts, the apostles are going about, including others in the love of God, and the temple people are getting annoyed because it's cutting into their economy. You see, the temple required for the forgiveness of sins that you came and you had to buy a dove, or you had to buy a lamb, or you had to buy a goat, or you had to buy a heifer. And then you have to have the priest kill the heifer, and it was the blood that made him free from sin. Jesus freed people simply by his word. He freed them by including them in the love of God. The apostles were facing hardship from religious powers. But they felt that they could not cease from doing what Jesus wanted them to do. They said to the apostles, who should we listen to? Your religious authority? Or should we listen to the authority of God? Now this is from people who had come to know God by their relationship with Jesus, who was the example of God's love in human form. Now I'd like to move to the book of Revelations because the book of Revelations was written sometime after the death and resurrection of Jesus, sometimes after the formation of the apostolic community, and it was written in a time when the whole Roman Empire was in decline. It was moving into chaos. It was becoming disorderly, where once righteous people had ruled, now unrighteous people were ruling. It was becoming corrupt. People were being exploited and people were being oppressed by the power. And the faith community, the community in the name of Jesus, was resisting them. And because of this, they were being tortured. They were being imprisoned. They were being killed. Just as all over the earth right now, people are being harshly treated because they are resisting the abuse of power. The book of Revelations and the chapter that we read today ends with the notion that Jesus is coming again. And the image that is used is Jesus is coming on the clouds. And this is an example from Jewish mythology, this whole notion of drop by drop the river grows till all at once it overflows. As each one of us determines that the way of Jesus is going to be the way we want to live our lives, we become part of a new reality. And drop by drop, a cloud is formed. And right now in the earth, as oppression seems to be gaining the upper hand, as injustice seems to be gathering power to exploit and oppress, it seems that here and there, persons are accepting the word of God and turning around and going in a new direction. And that body of persons bearing witness to the love of God in the earth is growing. It may not be very visible, but at some point it's going to become visible. And then the whole world is going to have a choice. Either they are going to accept and follow the way that God is revealing through the faithful people, or they will reject it. Up until this time, history shows that most often the powers that profit from the way in which the world presently exists are resistant. My hope is that this time, at this stage of human history, people will say, yes, let's try God's way. Let's give up our way. Let's do what we can to make a difference. Now I'm going to end with the text from the Psalms because this is a psalm, it's the last psalm in the book of Psalms, and it's a psalm that expresses great rejoicing. The idea being that we are liberated from everything that separates us from God. We are now liberated and experiencing the love of God. And this ought to be the source of joy within us. It ought to be the source of peace within us. 
And as that joy and peace begins to grow, they will overflow and enter into all of our relations. And we will be part of the change that God is doing in the earth just now. It's harvest time. The seed will be gathered into the grain meat. The chaff and the stubble will be plowed under. And a new season of growth will begin. I'm hoping you want to be part of that change. I'm hoping you want to be part of creating with God a new heaven and a new earth. A heaven and earth filled with peace and joy. And I'll leave it at that for now. Amen.